is the video you've been looking for. This is the video I've been talking about. This is the video. Take a look at his before. Now look at my before. And keep in mind, we had a slew of medications and now we are medication free. He's no longer on a walker. Now look at these before and after pictures. Tell me we haven't found the secret. So. Now I'm bringing you Dr. Tony Hampton, and we got an opportunity to ask him questions just for you. If you are new to the carnivore diet, if you just wanna know more about the carnivore diet, if you just want that documentation, then this is the video for you. Check this out. Hey everybody, my name is G Brown, G Brown the Lifestyle Changer, and- I'm Frederick Brown. The husband. And we have a special guest. This is Dr. Tony. All right. Also, his full name, Dr. Tony Hampton. And he has uh, agreed to help us help you make a decision in your life. So uh, tell us a little bit real quick who you are. You're just all the good stuff. Well, First of all, thank you for what you guys are doing. It's so important that we're out here teaching. I think we're all teachers by heart or we wouldn't be doing this work. So continue to do that. I think that's so important. Uh, for me, I'm actually a doctor who has training in family medicine, obesity medicine. I have a master's in nutrition and functional medicine. And all of that has come together to make me uh, what I call the metabolic health doc. I'm also a father. And I have two young men who are in their 20s. And I also have my college sweetheart. I've been married for 30 years as of June of 2023. So we getting old, but we're loving it. That's right. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. And so, so, so basically, a metabolic health doc is someone who understands how to heal people. When, I, when, I, when you get a traditional education in America, you learn about you know quality of care. And they have these things called heatest measures. And what those things do is that it, they're standards that we're supposed to achieve. Now, the problem with the standards is that although they're good, they're not getting to the root cause. They, they don't want you to overuse medications, uh, inappropriately you know, have people in the ER if they're not needed. They, they want you to manage chronic disease. They want you to manage it. And that's a problem. They, they do want you to focus on behavioral health and things like that, screening and prevention. But, but the key is that they want you to manage. And so, so although I still define some of my success by some of those measures, I shifted my paradigm to one where I'm not managing my patients and keeping them, you know, on medicine forever. Instead, I'm, I'm learning how to do prevention and healing. And, there's, and, and I do that by number one, I try to help them achieve metabolic health that's their blood pressure, blood sugar, triglycerides, HDL, and their abdominal circumference being in a normal range. I do it by addressing their social determinants of health. Many people struggle because of lack of fresh food, uh, financial barriers, and, and maybe they don't have transportation or can't afford, afford to copay on their medicines. So I wanna help them address those. And then lastly, I want healthcare to be equitable so that when people struggle, I don't point at them and say they struggle because they're not trying to work hard at being healthy. They struggle because they need help. And our job is to help them get through that struggle. So, so that's kind of who I am. And that's why, how I have to find my life. And I, my life purpose is to help everybody become metabolically healthy. Awesome. Awesome. So can you tell our audience, you know, kind of describe what the carnivore diet is, right? And, and how it differs from other dietary approaches. Absolutely. And uh, in a large conventional health system, I'm with Advocate Health, 
uh, I don't think most doctors could define it because it's not considered standard of care. But I've learned that this dietary pattern has helped me uh, tremendously. And I really am so thankful that I found it. Uh, so basically, I consider when I get my master's in nutrition and functional medicine, uh, they talked about elimination diet. So it's a diet that eliminates most of the foods that most people eat. And, it, and you end up with more of an animal-based diet. I would also argue that it's an ancestral appropriate diet. In other words, uh, our hunters and gatherers of the past, this is actually how they ate and, and they thrive because of that. Um, so compared to a, a standard American diet, you know, what we do is we focus on eating what's essential. And, and most people don't know that there's three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbs, and that carbs are not essential. <laughs> it's hard to imagine that we have a macronutrient that's not. In other words, your body will make the glucose from your fat and protein. You don't have to get it from putting it in your mouth. It's also true that this elimination diet where you're down to primarily meat, it doesn't have the things that plants have, which are anti-nutrients, which can uh, keep you from absorbing the nutrients in the plants. How ironic is that? Uh, yeah. The molds and things like that that come with plants. And, 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 and when you try to treat those plants with pesticides, you end up ingesting that. And all of these things culminate in inflammation. So we want to avoid that altogether. There are some carnivores who eliminate you know, the sugar grains and processed food and artificial sweeteners. But you have some keto, keto carnivores. And those are the people who are like, I'm going to do a little monk fruit, uh, pure monk fruit, a little pure stevia, allulose to sweeten their fo uh, foods. And, and they may even have things like uh, plant oils, like avocado and olive oil. But for the most part, if you're a purist, you won't do that. But some people do that. And we never demonize people. This is not a cult. It's just a, a way of eating and you do what works for you. We tend to eat, uh, you know what I mean? We eat uh, nose to tail, meaning that we try to eat the entire animal when possible. Uh, we also are comfortable instead of using uh, plant fats, we may end up using things like beef tallow and lard, the stuff that mama used to have on the counter. And now we throw away, we need to keep that and use that to cook with. We also tend to eat eggs and dairy. So those are the types of things that uh, a carnivore will eat. Uh, so most of them avoid the spices. We're kind of like, we use salt. But if a, if a carnivore de decides to use spices, nobody will penalize them. But those are things that uh, some will or won't do. And then of course, uh, we drink water primarily, but there are some carnivores who will have coffee periodically, even though that's not really uh, animal-based. Some, but broths are animal-based, so a lot of carnivores will drink the the broths, and uh, and those are that's just a big high-level approach. But at the end of the day, you're eating from the animal kingdom and avoiding the plant kingdom. And I tell you, when I started doing that, the healing began. Awesome, awesome. So, so. What what actually? Um, how did you become interested in 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 this lifestyle? And, and another question I want to ask you. I know my wife didn't forewarn you, but you know, is uh is, is your wife partaking in in this lifestyle? Yeah, oh, well, awesome. thirty years of marriage, right? So let me let me. Right. She kind of is. She's more of a key to voice. So it's almost like I'm Dr. Yeah. Kim Berry and she's Nisha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she feels that if I, because for me, it's all, all about tolerance. I have an irritable bowel history. My wife does not. So she tolerates more plants than Dr. Tony. However, um, we it, it really works well because maybe in the past we would have, we felt like we had to have two vegetables, maybe three. Now it's like, it's, it's, it's the ribeye and she may throw some yellow squash in there for herself. So that's typically what happens. But man, for her, she's a type one diabetic. And because of this dietary pattern, her blood sugars are just like a straight line. There's no spikes. Wow. And yeah, right. so and that's the real, that's the only way you can really do that. So, so that's the first thing. Number two is for me, I, we, I put my family through the whole vegetarian thing for seven to eight years. They tolerated me, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we had, tofu steaks and things like that. But but what we learned is that for me, I still had this irritable bowel problem. It was way better. So let's be clear. 
Some people do fine with plant-based, but for me, it was better, but I was still bloated. I still had abdominal pain and the cramps that came with it. And every once in a while, every couple of months, I'm in the bathroom and I just didn't want to live that way. So so I started to experiment just like everybody. I did a Google search and I I, I left my my plant-based uh, you know, rabbit hole and f- fell into the low carb rabbit hole. And once I fell into that rabbit hole, and I'm so thankful I did, I felt much better on low carb. Uh, then I also noticed that certain vegetables bothered me. So I kind of went all the way to keto where I'm doing less than maybe 20 total carbs a day. And then I started noticing the people I respect, Dr. Eric Westman, Dr. Ken Berry, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and others, Dr. Ovedia. And I said, man, I respect these guys, and they're kind of moving towards this kind of a thing. So, so what that did, as we are trying to do, as we share these messages, it gives people permission. We're just trying to give people permission to do their own experiment. And when I did the carnivore experiment for the very first time in my life, I didn't know I had a stomach. The symptoms just went away. And and I didn't have to worry about where's the bathroom. I didn't have to worry about I'm about to make a speech and I hope I don't have to, you know, where do I have to use the bathroom before I speak? All of that stuff went away. So the first benefit for me was uh, my stomach got better. The the other thing, and if I were to kind of show you my hand a little bit, if you look closely, you may notice those knots right there. Now, mm-hmm. what that, so that's something called uh, the pretrans contractors. Do pretrans contractors is is sometimes those those ligaments will get that knot and then it'll bend, and 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 the and it's not a painful condition like arthritis, but the problem with it is that it does ache sometimes. But guess what? Doesn't ache anymore. It doesn't ache because when I change wow. my diet, all that inflammation goes away. Now, the other benefits, and it's really important for a doctor who's busy, my energy level, my ability to focus, uh, mental clarity, all of those things kind of really were awesome. My, my skin seemed to get, my wife got jealous. She said, what you doing? Is it eczema? What is it? I said, it's <laughs> carnivore <laughs> because of all those you know, collagen and gristles and things like that. So it's nice to be able to, you know, maintain your youth as long as possible. And, and, and more than anything, it gives you self-confidence and a sense of well-being, right? So I've, yeah. I've always been a pretty positive person, but when you feel this good, you go to clinic, you're energetic, you're inspiring people, you make your teams feel better, you have energy left in the tank. Because even after we have our conversation, when my wife comes home, I got energy left in the tank. My son's about to yep. go out of town. He needs some help packing. I got the energy to do that. So it's really, it's a it's a gift that I can't put into words. And, and this is a gift I want to give to other people. So that's why I love doing this to spread this message. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so let me, um, let's talk to beginners. Yes. Uh, someone that wants to uh, adopt this lifestyle what would they do? How would they? Uh, today is day one. Yeah. And what is your yeah. suggestion for day one? When I when I created uh, my Protecting Your Nest podcast, one of the uh, letters in the nest is T. And the T is for how we think and also recovering from trauma if you've had trauma. But the T is important. In fact, podcast episode number 14 is a great episode because it talks about those self-limiting beliefs, right? So for me, it's all about the mind. I think 70, 80% of your success with any lifestyle change is mental. So for me, I want people to start with Think about my mind first. Am I ready to do this? And then you ask yourself, why do I want to bother? You know, why do I want to bother? Is there something I'm trying to fix, right? Is there some a problem I'm trying to solve? Now we believe that uh, carnivore and keto diets of that nature will fix a lot of things. I even made a video. Keto is the you know the hammer that fixes everything, and that sounds crazy, but it really does for most of us. So. You define your why. And for some people, I want to be able to get on my knees and play with my grandbaby. Uh, I want to be able to go to Jamaica and go to the 
that little uh, waterfall that you have to walk up and and not you know and not go there in a wheelchair. Uh, I want to be able to see my grand great grandbaby graduate from college. So those are whys, and we put a, and then I tell my patient put that picture of that grandbaby on the refrigerator and 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 let that be a daily reminder of why you're doing what you're doing. The second thing I think people should do when they're getting started is to you know. Think about a timeline. You know, everything in life is a little bit of an experiment. So we have all these challenges by people uh, in this community. Get on a 30-day challenge. Get on a, a three-month challenge. And after you do that for a while, if you feel better, then why not continue? So I, I think, and what you'll find is that you will feel better, minus some initial things that could happen. They have... Uh, you know, keto flu, carnivore flu like things. So the key is to know what those things are, expect them. Most people don't get it, but if you get it, you know it's coming and you're going to get past that within a week or so. Uh, The next thing I would do, and I do this with patients often, when I'm talking to patients, we come up with a plan and I say, okay, let's call your wife. Let's call your husband. Let's call whoever your accountability partner is. And you're going to say to them, listen, I'm about to make this change. I'm tired of being on medicines. Are you willing to walk with me? You don't have to do it yourself, but I need somebody to walk with me. So that family member, that coach, uh, steak and butter gal, gang, whatever, just anybody that's going to walk with you, that's going to help you. And and for those who have processed food addictions, I encourage them uh, on my link tree. Thank you for sharing that. There's a, a Joan Iflin's processed food addiction questionnaire. And if you need that kind of support, join a group like that to get through the they, they are struggling. The last thing is to be comfortable with incremental change. Uh, this is we're not building Rome in a day. <laughs> we're just trying to get better. So let's let's have incremental change, and then we're going to celebrate the small wins. And it doesn't have to be on the scale. It can be that belt buckle. It can be that mental clarity. It can be the fact that you have all this energy. It could be that you actually just did the diet, and we're going to celebrate that. And then by doing that, you you make your expectations reasonable. But more importantly, you have uh, just a, an approach that I have found is better than micromanaging everything you're doing. I don't think that's a healthy way to live. And by the way, of the dietary patterns out there, there may not be an easier dietary pattern to uh, maintain. All I need is an air fryer and a, and a ribeye, and I'm good. So it's just so much yeah. easier. And, and for people who are not into all the details and measuring, you don't have to do any of that with the carnivore dietary pattern. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you, what are some common um, struggles, challenges for newbies? And you, the, the biggest one is, to me, the keto carnivore flu. Yeah, yeah. It can is. you go? Uh, can yeah. you share a little bit of what they might feel? Yeah, let's talk about that. And and I think again, I'm about root cause of why things are what they are. So uh, if you think about it, uh, if you're not taking in carbs, you're then not going to create the glucose that can then be stored as glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in humans, animals, where starch is the storage form of glucose in plants, right? So so what happens is within 18 to 24 hours of uh, not consuming any type of carb, you will deplete the glycogen in your muscles. And when you deplete the glycogen, uh, if you didn't get the memo, glycogen is attached to water. And because it's attached to water and you've depleted it, you a lot of people get a lot of water loss when they start this dietary pattern. So so you're gonna, and that'll make you feel a little, you know, dehydrated potentially, right? And the other thing that happens when you're doing this dietary pattern and you're not used to it, you've you've eliminated the need to make all of that insulin. And anybody that looks at a protein fat graph graph, they'll notice that the thing that raises the, the glucose the much is carbs. You've eliminated that. But when you raise glucose, you also raise insulin. But with this dietary pattern, the insulin level is going to be low. And, and when the insulin level is low, you're actually going to lose salt in your urine. So imagine you're 
on two medicines, three medicines for blood pressure, you start this dietary pattern, you start getting rid of salt, your blood pressure is going down, which is actually a good thing. But if you don't lower the dose of the medicine, it's not a good thing. So, so, the, so the real thing that needs to happen in that setting is to get a doctor in front of you who understands what's happening so they can wean you off your medicine. So, so because of all the things happening with the low glucose and you're getting rid of the glycogen stores and you're not, a, you know, you're getting rid of salt, you can get dehydrated. Uh, you will lose electrolytes because uh, what happens is when you lose water, salt follows potassium follows and magnesium follows. So people with this dietary pattern tend to have to think about electrolytes. I actually didn't start taking electrolytes until maybe nine months into carnivore <laughs> and I felt fine. But then one day I was like, well, my, I'm having some cramps. What's up? So when I started having cramps, I started taking, I take keto chow uh, electrolytes and I do fine. I know plenty of people that don't take electrolytes, so I think it depends. So you're going to be dehydrated potentially in the beginning. You may have electrolyte issues, and some people are not getting enough fat. And, and when you don't have the right amount of fat, and you do need fat in your diet, that's why we like things like ribeye, you, you're going to have the headache, fatigue, nausea, potentially constipation, maybe even sleep issues. So how do you solve this problem? Very easy. Well, you take electrolytes if you need it. You stay hydrated and you eat more fatty food. And if you do those things, you'll be fine. The beautiful thing is once you become fat adaptive, keto adaptive, meaning your body is used to burning fat for fuel, all, you just feel phenomenal. So you have to kind of, it's almost like uh, going through withdrawal. And, and once you get past that, and most people, I, had, I didn't have any of these symptoms because I was already, already keto, right? So I've already kind of mm -hmm. uh, primed my body. But for people who go from more of a standard American diet to carnivore, they need to be more aware of these tips so they'll know what to do. And it's been, uh, again, you feel so good. You don't want to go back to that old life. So I'm, I'm loving right. it. Yeah. Right. Right. So you've already uh, given us some examples of, of the types of food, I guess one should yeah. try and adhere to when they're following this diet. But one of the things that, that my wife and I um, often run into um, when dis discussing, having this conversation with people about it, um, their why seems to be more weight loss than anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, and oftentimes we do find people that have other uh, physical ailments that they like to, to cure. But most times mm -hmm. it's it's um, weight loss. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, uh, you know, how, how do you feel about snacking? Because one of the things that we run into is people not really understanding that you need to eat to satiety they don't understand you need to eat until you're fully satiated they, right they, right they, that's they, right. still kind of thinking about that caloric deficit in terms of losing weight and, and they just you know don't eat enough and they just keep on eating and they that's can't right, lose weight right. so <laughs> yeah so what do well, you, what, what do you what do you feel about that that's good i think i think first of all um if a person snacking on uh you know an appropriate a uh, carnivore appropriate snack and they're a carnivore there's not a problem however what i find is that people tend to snack because they're not doing what you just suggested if you don't eat until you're full then there's a problem so when i think about big picture right we already talked about this but let's just review so i'm not eating sugar i'm going to avoid the sweeteners because the artificial sweeteners can trigger you a little bit and make you hungry because your brain's like wait a minute that's sweet so so now it's going to do all of these metabolic things that are going to try to connect with that sugar you can't find sugar the liver say you know what don't worry about it i'll just release a little extra sugar because <laughs> your liver makes <laughs> sugar so you're you're chasing your tail and that's going to potentially cause a problem you're going to Processed foods will make you hungry. So we're going to avoid uh, processed foods because they make you hungry. And, and nuts and seeds, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, you know, peanuts, which are more legumes, they're beans, but you put peanuts on the counter, even the metabolic health doctor is going to struggle not walking by and grabbing a handful. And, yeah. and in my old life, I would grab a handful, come back later, grab a handful. So those things make you hungry. Dr. Eric Westman tells you just don't even bother with nuts. 
and seeds when yeah. you're starting because mm -hmm. it's just too tempting. So the first part is know what to avoid grains, uh, you know, the beans and the nuts and seeds and things of that nature. Now, then you eat that ruminant. What I what I have seen, and this is not science, but what I have seen is that when you eat ruminant meat, you tend to be fuller, you tend to be happier. And and for for the for the lay person, those are the animals with a couple of stomachs, and they're you know they that's why you see the cow you know chewing on that I think it's called cud. They're just chewing mm -hmm. goat. So we want to eat the goat. We want to eat the beef, the lamb, the elk, antelope. It depends on how far in the country you want to go. The deer. <laughs> that's yeah. the meat that tends to satiate us. We also are allowed to eat the pork, the chicken the duck, the salmon, and things of that nature. But but again, the, the ruminant is where you want to focus. Non-ruminant is fine too. And then you can also eat other types of uh, seafoods, the bone broth we talked about. And and you just want to make sure that when you're dealing with oils, they're the 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 you know the the ghee, which is clarified butter, butter, beef tallow, uh, you know, you can do cheese. Uh, so you can do these types of dairy things. And uh, and I think if you have that kind of global approach, so unlike the previous food pyramids that would have the grains, I mean, if you look at a food pyramid these days, it'll blow your mind. I mean, you're you're like, so I'm going to tell a person with diabetes to eat cereal and pasta and bread. That's the foundation of that old food pyramid. Our foundation is just ruminant meat. And and that's right. and then we'll have a you know we we'll drink our water or salt and then we'll have a little bit of these different types of non ruminant animals and a little dairy maybe some cheese but I tell you it's so simple and for most people they love eating this way they feel that eating this way is uh, satisfying and uh, and you don't have to convince people to eat this way uh, there's a few people who don't like red meat but I think some of that is psychological because they've been told their whole lives. Don't eat that. Saturated fat is going to kill you. It's going to cause cancer. And all of that is based on old studies that were nutritional studies based on observational studies, meaning they were somebody getting a survey sent to their house. It's not real research. Or they're just looking in the, in the data on the computer and saying, okay, we're going to look at the data and make a decision. We need real research. And, in, and every time we do real research, we find that animal-based diets are not harmful for cancer. They're not harmful for heart disease. And, and protective against stroke. Who knew that saturated fat was protective against a stroke? So it's the opposite wow. of what we've been learning. Everything. And my job and, and you guys' job, as I'm hanging with the Browns today, is to get this word out. Because I'm telling you right now, the average person hasn't heard it. The average doctor hasn't heard it. The average nutritional patient, uh, you know, professional hasn't heard it. And so, and, and if that's true, we got a lot of work to do, guys. Yeah. Actually, you're starting to answer uh, my next question for you, because um, what are give me at least three typical um, conditions mm -hmm. that the carnivore diet is just really known to uh, take care of? And do you have um, a personal story or it could be yeah. a patient because you're not saying their name of where okay. you've just really seen that turnaround? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually, um, it's hard to like have one story, but I, I have them because I do podcasts, right? So so I'll tell you a patient's name because she was on a podcast, okay? But before okay. I do that, let's think of the buckets, right? So when I'm in clinical practice, when you know what's recommended is low carb and keto by the American Diet so Diabetes Association, by the American Heart Association, by the... Uh, but the Society of Clinical Endocrinology, right? So what I do is I look at the person in front of me and and who do I say carnivore for, right? And I have to say it in the context of, we have an observational study that 90, it's called behavioral characteristics and, you know, in carnivores, uh, I think it was Sean Baker's group, 95% had improvement. So we know that type of study has shown that it's effective, but we need more randomized controlled trials. So what we're looking at is we see anecdotal evidence that people are doing well. I tell my patients, we're going to measure the metabolic labs, like an A1C for your blood sugar. And as long as those numbers are okay, we're going to keep rolling with this. So I just tell them, this is where we are, and this is why I recommend it. Number one, no brainer, autoimmune diseases, because Dr. Hampton thinks his 
you know, his irritable bowel condition, which I don't realize I have anymore, was it's more of an autoimmune disease. So for people with mm -hmm. any type of autoimmune disease, it's a no brainer, primarily because a leaky gut, meaning the tight junctions in your intestines are not tight anymore, allowing larger proteins to be absorbed. And some of those larger proteins look like your own body. And because it looks like your own body, your body, it, it looks like that. It looks like the uh, the protein, they attack the protein. And then when they attack the protein, they attack your body and you end up with an autoimmune like lupus. So people with that should consider it. Um, number two, mental illness. Um, uh, you know, some of the greats in our space, like Dr. Georgia Ede, I did a, a podcast with her. If you have mental illness, you should check that out. Just search Dr. Georgia E. DE and uh, my name. And she was from Harvard and she left Harvard because they told her, you can't talk about nutrition. You're a, psych a psychiatrist. But yet it was the most effective tool in her toolkit to help people. Say the heal. name one more time for it. Doctor, so uh, it's Georgia, G-E-O-R-G-I-A. Mm -hmm. Last name is Ede, E-D-E. Dr. Georgia okay. Ede. And she's known with Dr. Eric Westman of Duke for this keto for refractory mental illness study, which showed that, uh, you know, literally 100% of the hospitalized people with mental illness, 100% had improvement in their symptoms. 96% had weight reduction. Somewhere near 50% had uh remission now imagine having bipolar schizophrenia or, or severe depression you're in the hospital and you go into remission before you leave it's very difficult to prove you know to do that and lastly uh uh 64 and you won't believe this had um a reduction in their medications while going into remission before they left the hospital now i want you to now is there a drug that can do that absolutely not and i think the reason yeah. why is because when you have neurotransmitters, and we think a lot of this is based on, you know, those neurotransmitters like serotonin, when you just take a drug that only targets that one neurotransmitter, that's not how the body works. The various neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and others, they work together. So if you just overload with one, then it's going to disrupt the whole, neuro, you know, metabolic pathways. And what happens is you end up getting uh, side effects, even if you feel better. So, so treating this with diet is a much better approach. So autoimmune conditions, uh, things that deal with mental health, and then what we call neurodegenerative conditions. A neurodegenerative condition would be something like dementia, part, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, Huntington's. These are all what we call neurodegenerative conditions. They have all been found to be effective. So those are the three main buckets, but the most obvious one, if I can do a bonus one, is metabolic diseases. I'm the metabolic health doc. <laughs> so your blood pressure is a metabolic condition. Diabetes is a metabolic condition. Um, cancer is a metabolic condition. There's something called the Warburg effect. And the Warburg effect means cancer prefers glucose fuel instead of fuel from ketones. So if you shrink your belly and use belly fat for fuel, cancer cells don't like that, but they do like the sweet potato pie. So what happens is when you do a PET scan to look for cancer in the body, they just put mm -hmm. some, some glucose in your arm and it goes straight to the cancer. So what does that tell you? So if we avoid feeding the cancer, rather we're trying to prevent it or uh, we're trying to uh, fight it, you want to reduce the starch and sugar in your body. So what better way to do that than to eliminate <laughs> the carbs? That's right. That's that's right. It, you know, so keto and carnivore for cancer is a no-brainer. And again, it's hard for people to put their brains around that. But as you understand the biochemistry and the science, it becomes a little clear. Yeah. What One of the, the, the biggest um, things we encounter when we're discussing uh, this lifestyle um, everyone wants to know how it's a cholesterol. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we, we've, I've done a little research, you know, and I want to get your professional take on it. Um, my wife just had, um, her lipid panel, uh, results and, and, and her numbers were phenomenal, except mm -hmm. the total cholesterol the total. was high 
and the LDL was high, you know, yeah. and, and knowing, knowing what's really important, right, is, is, is that triglyceride to HDL ratio. Um, okay, cool. So I kind of want to get you to talk about total cholesterol because what I found out is that what I didn't know is that out of these trillions and trillions of cells that we have in our bodies, I mean, our bodies, we got trillions yeah. of cells of, of, of cholesterol in our body, oh, you yeah. know. Over 23% yeah. of it is in our brain. So it's really necessary. And if it's necessary, why do we want to lower it? I, that just doesn't make sense to me. And it should make sense. And um, so let's talk about that. And I think I'm going to circle back because I forgot to give you a, a patient example. So I'm going to do that too. But let's talk about cholesterol first. So it is true that first the first thing that people need to understand, which is so amazing that like if you look up what is the total cholesterol? You'll notice that the components of the total cholesterol are not just the LDL. It's not just the HDL, but it's the triglycerides too. So if you have a, imagine a person comes before you and their HDL, which is a good cholesterol, is high. Wouldn't that make the total cholesterol high? Yeah. So when you see a total cholesterol, there's not enough information in that number to tell you should you be concerned or shouldn't you be concerned. The same is true for the so-called bad cholesterol. So, and I don't think there's a such thing as a bad cholesterol. So the LDL is considered the bad cholesterol. Um, and they, and when I learned this in medical school, they said L for lousy, uh, you know, H for healthy. And that was kind of how we remembered which one was good or bad. But the question becomes, is it really bad? And so this is what I've learned. I've learned that what you want to be able to do is um, break the cholesterol down into small and large particles. So for example, um, if you have large particles of your LDL cholesterol, that cholesterol is not as harmful as the small particles. So, so for a person right. who's having that change, that person should then say, Doc, could you order the particle sizes? Uh, because I want to see if they're small or large. And if you have, again, more large, less small, you're okay. But there's other things that can be done. For example, um, your, the, we've talked about how the triglycerides and HDL are part of the metabolic uh, syndrome. Well, if you're triglycerides divided by your HDL ratio is less than two, that's predictive of not having to worry about this as well. So, so when I look at a cholesterol panel, I'm really just focused on the triglycerides and HDL. And if I'm, if I'm concerned about the LDL, I'll do particle sizes. The other test that can be ordered is a test called the APO protein B to A ratio. That's more predictive of future heart attacks than cholesterol and LDL. Lipoprotein small particle A, that's more of a one-time test, but that's more predictive. And then, of course, I would get a calcium score test because the calcium score test will go straight to the source. Do you have plaques in your artery or not? And if you don't, then there's no need to worry. So, so you having an elevation in your LDL is actually expected on a dietary pattern where you're eating more saturated fat but now we know, as uh, Frederick was suggesting, the saturated fat is good for you. In fact, I need saturated fat for my testosterone. So if I'm trying to have a, a, a manhood that's at the appropriate level, right, I need to have cholesterol right. that will then make sure my testosterone is being made, which will then impact my libido. So now I'm interested in intimacy because my cholesterol is okay. So for me... It's a no-brainer, and I wouldn't worry about that at all. So with that, I think I'm going to go to a really quick testimonial, and I love sharing this story because it's one thing to help a complete stranger. It's another to help somebody that works in your health system. So I had a chance to meet a young lady by the name of Gwendolyn Butler. So if they search Dr. Tony Hampton and Gwendolyn Butler on YouTube, she was a guest on the Protecting Your Nest podcast, and um, and she she was interesting because she heard my message and I was just saying, we got to reduce these carbs and, and let's see how you do. Right. And she, she, so she didn't really hear me though. Well, she, she, she heard me, but she didn't hear me, but something 
happened at work. She bumped her head. And when she bumped her head, she was being asked by her uh, team, uh, and I didn't see her because it was more of an acute situation, you need to go to the hospital. She went there, and of course, they ordered an MRI. When they ordered the MRI, it showed uh, what we call microvascular disease or ischemic vascular disease, meaning the small vessels in your brain are kind of clogging up, right? Now, she's in healthcare, and as a medical assistant, she knew that that was going to be trouble. She, By the way, she had diabetes, was on insulin, by the way, I think she may have been smoking. So in that moment, she knew that her risk for a stroke and dementia was, was going to be high. So, so now she had tangible evidence that maybe I need to do something with this diet. And so what she ended up doing is, uh, you know, getting on a diet where it's mostly animal based and she was able to get off of insulin that she had been on for 11 years within 45 days. Now I want you to think about that. If you're, if you've been told by your clinician that you're going to be on insulin for the rest of your life and you didn't know that it was possible to get off of insulin, then you would just live a life thinking that's your life. So imagine what that means for her, not just the cost of not having to stick her finger, you know, every, every uh, strip that you use to, you know, every lancet, every time you check your sugar, I think it's the strips, they cost a dollar a piece. We don't have to worry about that anymore. How much does insulin cost? You don't want to know. When you're on insulin, it can increase your risk for low sugars. You know, you're, you're always worried and you're constantly eating so you won't have low sugars and all of that worry is gone. So so she's just one example. I took seven people off medicines two weeks ago in one week. She's just one example of what's possible. You cannot get off medicines by taking more medicine. You get off medicine by removing the poison. And for most people who are who have metabolic disease, the poison is excessive carbs in the form of sugar, in the form of grains, in the form of processed food and, and, and rice, pasta, potatoes, corn and bread. And I know I'm hurting some people, but it's going to hurt you more to be on dialysis. It's going to hurt you more to have a stroke. It's going to hurt you more to have a heart attack. It's going to hurt you more to have an amputation. So this is not a sacrifice. This is the path to healing. So I'm glad that Gwendolyn shared her story. And I'm glad you asked me about somebody, just an example uh, of what's possible when you do this. Yeah. So, okay. Now they have their why. They understand uh, ruminant meat. So then my next question, how can individuals maintain their commitment to the carnivore lifestyle? Mm-hmm. For the long run, uh, yeah. because the thing that I get, how can you just eat meat all the time? And, and then they start thinking about, I want this, I want this. I say, and those, the this and the this are the yeah. things that's making you sick. Yeah, so, right. yeah, what give give that mm, that they can possibly go past 30 days Uh Frederick and I are uh, six months in. So what are some things that you, uh, to just kind of keep it going? Yeah, for me, um, now I'm blessed to have a history of irritable bowel. So irritable bowel is not like, you know, they call hypertension or high blood pressure the silent killer. And they say that because you don't, you don't always feel things, right? Now, some people do and some people don't. Um, so, but irritable bowel is not silent. It's very loud. So for me, it's easy for me to maintain because I know when I eat that rich, delicious dressing that my mama make, right? I love my mama. Martin said, my mama biscuits. My mama make good biscuits too. <laughs> but I already know that certain foods will hurt me. So the first thing is that I'm, I recognize that everybody doesn't have that. Now, but what I also know that helps keep me aligned with my, my goals of maintaining this diet is I, I know why I was born, okay? Now for me, when, I, when somebody asked me this question a long time ago, they said, well, why were you born? 
you know, and then I had to think twice about that. And then I realized I was born to spread the healing message of metabolic health once I kind of figured it out. And you got to take time to think this through. So once I knew that, I I heard a motivational person say, I need you to now spend, it must have been Jim Rowan or somebody, because I used to listen to a lot of motivational old school folk, right? Once you know what your goal is in life, you spend the rest of your life honoring that. And it may have been uh, Eric Thomas. It may have been Eric Thomas, the, the hip hop preacher. You spend the rest of your life trying to achieve why you were born. Every day I wake up. So guess what? I'm doing it right now by spending time with you guys recording this video and sharing this message of healing. I am doing what I was born to do. The other thing that I tell patients, I'm telling you, I tell patients that, you know, expect to struggle, expect to struggle, but like a cloud, the struggle will come, but soon after it's going to go away. So I'm, so I'm looking for clouds. I'm like, where's my cloud at today? I ain't seen it today. <laughs> because it's going to come. And I'm, I've just been, I've trained myself to expect it. And I also acquire skills on how to deal with it. For example, a storm yes. could come in the form of Dunkin' Donuts or uh, Starbucks. I thought Starbucks was going to put Dunkin' Donuts out of business, but they sure didn't. In fact, it looked like they got more business. Yeah. But for some people, driving by... Dunkin' Donuts is going to be a struggle. So Mm. I tell my patients, sometimes you see clouds, inspect them. Sometimes you just got to drive down a different block. Sometimes you got to go down (laughs) a different street. (laughs) So you won't have to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. And the last thing I say to people is that you were wonderfully made, okay? So you have a responsibility and an opportunity to do your best to take care of this gift called the human body, right? So when you think about your priorities, right? And for those who are spiritual, let it be God. And then you got, you know, family and things of that nature, but your health better be in the top two or three. And if, because if you take care of that, if you're spiritual, you can then serve God better. If you're just trying to be a good husband, you can be a better husband. You can be a better father. All of these things are possible but you got to take care of this, this gift that you've been given. So, uh, and, and so as a 55 year old, listen, guys, when I think about how I feel at 55, I promise you, I feel better than when I was 35. I promise you, I'm not making that up. And I was doing okay. I wasn't an unhealthy guy, but I was at, you know, Panera bread and we, you know, I don't, I don't have time to cook. We got it. So I tried to eat the healthy fast food, but if there's no healthy fast food. We need to cook at home and only do that periodically. And, and if you honor that body, everything gets better. So I really uh, just feel so grateful that I didn't have to wait till I was 80 years old to figure this stuff out. Yeah. Well, let me just add, it's 172 days for him, 170 days for me. Mm. And it's also our road to 60. He turns 60 next month. I turn yeah. 60 next year Amen. and we have our 20 year anniversary next year. So I just wanted to put that over in there. And I, I tell it, Oh, I'm 33. I will hold. And this is not one of those where, you know, people say 39 and holding Mm-mm. I'm 33 and I don't see myself past 33 on the inside. This That's is, right. this has been phenomenal. Yeah. 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 They have tests. And, and they have, they have tested to see what your chronological age is. I'm pretty sure if you guys did that test, I actually did a video where I linked to it. So I'm gonna have to find that and maybe share it with you guys. I yeah, guarantee your do. your chronological age is gonna not match your actual age. <laughs> it's gonna be yeah. lower. <laughs> Trust me. That's right. Sure. No doubt. Well, we we just on behalf of my wife and and at hanging with the Browns, we That's right. really wanted. Thank you for the time you spent with us today. Uh, we value your expertise yes. and your your insights. I know um, are will be valuable to our viewers, and and we just we we just really want to thank you. You know, yes. we really appreciate every word that you said, and we're gonna go back and look at this again and again and again. So, thank you for joining us. Well, thank yes. you okay. uh, for the opportunity, guys. You guys are. Uh, 
blessing me. And and I'll say this out loud. Uh, we we need to have different voices, uh, different personalities. And you guys have plenty of personality. I've seen your videos. So so I just want to thank you guys for, yes, ma'am. There's some entertainment on that channel. <laughs> so, so thank you for doing yeah. that because we want to make this fun, right? When I think about right. some of the people in our space, you know, we need fun. So we, we need more voices. So thank you so much for joining the family of uh, Keto Low Carb and Carnivore. We appreciate you guys. And we right. truly feel welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.